You are listening to Off the Shelf, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this next podcast by the Conference Board. My name is John Metzler, and I am your host of today. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome Avert Blyenberg, um, who is going to be speaking with us today um, for the Off the Shelf channel of the podcast series by the Conference Board. It's going to be a very special s- uh, session today. Um, Avert is going to talk about a very um, provocative concept. Um, of swarm organizations. And uh, that ob- obviously will ring some bells immediately. People will ask uh, swarm, what does it mean? And how do I, how can I relate that to my organization where I need structure, I need efficiency, um, and I need organization <laughs> within my organization. Ava, it's terrific to have you here. Um, you did a great job uh, before with my innovation council um, from which you got elevated to do the webcast we just finalized. And here we are again for those people who prefer a podcast over a webcast. Um, Evert, um, why don't you start by introducing yourself? Um, because I think it's, uh, it's a nice way to also introduce the concept of today, because I know your personal story is, uh, is in its own right already very interesting. Okay, hey, welcome, John. by the way, again, <laughs> go for it. Okay, John, thank you very much for the invitation and also for the introduction, very nice. Uh, very happy to be with TCB today uh, to talk about uh, basically my brainchild and wish for the future that this idea gets out there. Uh, so very short, uh, who I am, what I do, uh, I'm basically a consultant in strategy, organization, uh, technology and development. And I, most of my professional life revolves around thinking about these topics. Um, in 2020, I published a book, Swarm Organization, which is about the power of self-organizing, uh, systems. Very interesting. There's a lot of organizations like Mercedes-Benz, SAP, Agile. Uh, working on this concept and several high-ranking people think this is the solution for the future. Um, so uh, what is uh, what is my background? Uh, as short as possible, I spent about 25 years in senior management, predominantly in IT and telecommunications. Uh, I'm actually one of the guys to help to build the internet. I started in 1984 at Philips Telecommunication and Data Systems. And over the years, I was in many uh, senior management positions uh, uh, to do with these topics. Um, Well, basically over the years, my role uh, changed from technology to more uh, business management. And uh, I figured out that lots of things in organizations don't make sense at all. And um, so what happened after my last role was in 1999, I believe I was uh, executive director of operations and co-founder of Global Metro Networks. Uh, then we run into the uh, internet burst, the bubble burst. That was in 2001 after the 9-11 event. And uh, I decided to have enough, that I had enough of this whole world. And I, uh, I followed my passion. I became an underwater wildlife cameraman something completely different. Uh, I, uh, I uh, participated in several uh, documentaries about the state of our oceans. Uh, I uh, traveled the whole world. Um, I dive with whales, dolphins, sharks, everything, beautiful uh, adventures. And the thing what happened to me is at a certain moment during this uh, filming that was actually during the filming of the documentary, See the Truth, we encountered this big bait ball, you know, huge school of 10, 20,000 of fish. And uh, that struck me. How could 20,000 stupid fish, because they have a brain the size of a pea, organize themselves so well with so much harmony and so successful, right? And I I figured that uh, humankind is actually the only species that uses management and structure and control to arrange this. And I came to the conclusion, okay, what is our excuse? Why do humans need all this structure, all this management, all these processes? And uh, that's what started. And um, uh, the book is mostly about looking at natural self-organizing systems, uh, which are based on a few simple principles and are so tremendously beneficial for these animals. Can't we just take those principles and use them in in human organizations? And that is uh, mostly what the book is about. So in a nutshell. 
Well, that was uh, really, as I said, as I anticipated, a very um, uh, insightful but also um, exciting story of self-discovery and aha moment yeah. that really set you off into uh, into a whole new um, uh, life. Well, you actually had two new lives, right? First, you got in from business into uh, under deep sea, uh, you know, diving, underwater filming, documentary making, um, and then suddenly having this aha moment that set you off uh, for a whole new um, dimension. Uh, within uh, organizational constructs um, and how you right. manage corporations, yep. um, and that is indeed um, uh, you know counterintuitive. I um, my own experience is uh, thirty years of Procter and Gamble, of having lived in a relatively st- you know, structured organization. So, so the first question that would come to mind is, okay, that sounds uh, interesting. Swarms, indeed, you see them, you know, flying, you see them swimming, um, but we are humans, and uh, and we have goals, and we have objectives, and uh, we have things to do. <laughs> To go and uh, and 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 drive business forward and and hopefully create a better world. Um, so um, very very curious to uh, to uh, explore this um, uh, this discovery of yours more, and maybe you can continue your story by um, illustrating um, the core narrative, um, as you call it, of um, of of how, how the self organization. How do these fish indeed move? What are the elements? What are the aspects? Um, what are the principles? Of um, of uh, of swarms that you believe we can apply to um, uh, to businesses and organizations. Yeah, I, I gladly share that with you. Um, uh, I want I want to tell you we can do that later. Also, why we actually need this because this is this is also uh, people don't move if there is not a, a a need for it. But I'll come to this later. Um, the, the 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 most interesting part is that in nature and and we we don't think of it this way but all of nature the entire universe is self-organizing right and if you then look at uh, swarms the principles behind that are are there there's they're basically so simple they're so so intuitive they're they're so if you look at the show you say, why are we not doing this <clears throat> and in nature if you look at uh, at animals, they basically have just three drivers: eh? eat, don't get eaten, reproduce. You can easily just project that on an organization or a civilization if you want to. And from that, six principles come down, and these principles are, in a nutshell, that uh, basically they're all autonomous and self-organizing. The organization itself is role-based. This is a role-based organization design. Uh, all the animals have both uh, uh, generalist and specialist capabilities, so they can very easily shift from one role to another. The swarm has a holographic nature, which means that uh, all the animals have exactly, they know everything that's going on in the organization. They're, they're completely, they're basically a mini copy of the total. Uh, the fifth principle is that they're redundantly connected, so all are constantly in contact with each other, highly connected. And um, the sixth principle is that there is a very, uh, there's huge diversity in the swarm, which makes them extremely adaptive to anything that uh, that comes f- from them. And th- the ben- benefits are, are tremendous. I mean, if you look how these, and I studied them, I've been underwater watching these animals, I've been watching birds and all kinds of animals, even ants and bees. Uh, but also larger, you know, will the bees do the same? They're extremely innovative, right? They adapt extremely fast. They're highly connected and informed. They fluidly organize around events, uh, and it's all automatic. They do that. They solve problems at the point of occurrence where they are without any, without management interference whatsoever. Uh, they very easily shift roles, which makes them extremely efficient, and they're, they're very resilient and future-proof. It seems that this... They, they operate as one organism. They, they, they resonate and they follow one common purpose. And, 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 you know, if you look at that, then I had to run or I have run large teams, uh, 3,000 people. Uh, I, I wish I would have seen that in those, in those organizations, really. You see, when I hear you talk... Um... I, I get warmed up on the concept um, <laughs> because it gets me back to uh, 1974 where the Dutch total football took over the world um, where everybody did exactly pretty much what you said until the final that we miserably lost against the Germans because we forgot about the concepts. Um, so you see already how 
how sports teams, if you want, live some of those principles, correct? That's that's correct. Uh, see, I often get the question, uh, animals are not the same as humans. And that's true, right? As we are social, empathic, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not saying we're going to be like a natural swarm, but I'm looking at, can we use those principles? And then people say, well, but then still we're not the same. Uh, I actually have many examples of where we do this already we humans and but 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 one of the the most evident and and we hardly think of it as well if you look at the soccer team you just mentioned it right if you look at 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 uh at these players uh if 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 you uh if you uh think of it they're, they're all autonomous no the team is role-based right? you've got different roles they're all generalist and have a specialist uh, specialism you know they all know how to handle a ball but now then still you have the goalkeeper and the attackers and so on uh, they mirror each other they know all the tricks and the tactics uh, they're redundantly connected they keep le- constantly keep an eye on each other they're very uh, diverse they have a strong commonality the club and and a common purpose winning right so in essence if you if you look at something as simple as a human soccer team we already have a mini swarm there so we are already doing it and the funny part is you just mentioned it uh, why did we lose um the funny well, maybe thing... i don't want to think about it anymore <laughs> <laughs> see, see the thing is that you see often that small organizations under 50 people already are mini swarms and they work perfectly and then they grow bigger and the managers come in and all of a sudden it starts to change and uh i, I watched this happening several cases or so why do we do that? What what is actually the problem of going to that? But it's I guess a problem. Too. It's a problem with startups, right? Often, where you know you have all this elan, you have a small team that gets together, and then, Correct. as you said, you get to fifty or one hundred fifty people, and then the whole the, the the role of leadership changes, and immediately the default is okay. Let's structure. Let's organize. Yes. Um, yes. Who's in yes. charge? Um, yes. I promote this person. It's interesting because as I hear you talk, I also I also um, relate back to. Uh, to the industrial era, right? I mean, we have uh, developed our organizations so rigidly, so functionally often. Um, even today, I, I, when I go and talk to the business leaders, it's uh, one of the big challenges continues to be the siloing of functions. That's um, true. And, yeah. and so we built it, we did it to ourselves to some degree. And isn't it time to go back to nature to some uh, to some degree? Um, so. Yeah. yeah, well, well, I agree. Uh, so, so, um, to to go really quickly over this the 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 core of this problem what we're seeing right now is that that you know we're we're in a in an era with extreme changes right we see it's going quicker and quicker and 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 the changes are bigger they're faster they're more diverse they come more often so the change follows an exponential curve however unfortunately we humans have trouble keeping up with that and so our adaptation goes a lot slower and follows a logarithmic curve this creates an adaptation gap this this is known under uh, the concept of martex law and this causes all kind of problems and the the real thing is that we we stick to the thinking and behavior of the 20th century you just talked about uh what we've seen now this is and it's perfectly logical because in that era uh, everything was about mass producing goods, right? Efficiency. So we had efficiency, you know, large scale, uh, uh, the price had to go down, the quality had to go up. So we had the structure, we had to uh, bring in all those rules and regulations, which, which at that time worked fine. But now what we see the human behavior it's in our thinking and our behavior we resist change we we cling to the old uh, we focus uh, pre- pre- predominantly on individual performance and gain and we ignore the value of team of work and and that thinking with that thinking which is basically 20th century thinking we try to solve the problems we have right now in the 21st century with all these huge changes going on with a mindset of the industrial age and you clearly can see everywhere you look you know that that we're running into to the we're running to the edges of this system you know it's it's creaking and and all kinds of problems yeah we're seeing a lot of friction right now and, friction, and indeed we yeah. when i when i step back it we um we probably overstructured over systemed our business yep. our business planning our business processes and we um 
uh, we lost the humanity um, with, yeah. with, within it. While still, uh, right. you know, business innovation. I always say innovation is a is a team sport. It's a human based team sport. It's a multifunctional yeah. team sport. Absolutely. So how do we go and organize for that? Now that leads us maybe <laughs> into the second component. So we set up the basis for interest, if you want. Um, we identified the six principles. You mentioned six, right, David? Six principles yes. of, of yeah. the swarm concept, um, which resonated and, and made a nice analogy to. Uh, to how a sports team fundamentally does the same thing. So there is already a human uh, parallel uh, to it. Um, Absolutely. Ad- yeah. Addressing that challenge of does yes. it work for humans? Well, it works in sports. Yeah. Why not work in business? So let's right. now get into that uh, you know, double clicking of, of how do you go and, and go about developing that second part of your trinity of, of interventions, which is how do you organize for it? How do you develop it in your organizational structure? Um, with, or how do you, I sometimes say, how do you structure as a verb, not as a noun, <laughs> that, that is funny okay I'll, I'll keep that in mind that's a good one i have to remember that one yeah okay so so basically if we want to if we want to move from from our traditional hierarchical structure process control based organization to something that's much more natural right and we we then the first thing is what we have to do is that we have to uh, be convinced that that new narrative is necessary uh, and and that narrative that we took was basically looking at nature and saying, okay, nature has figured this out 250 million years ago. Why don't we copy that? So the first step is to adapt the narrative of self-organization. And then we use those six principles of self-organization to take that to, to another level. And then, then mostly the first question is, yeah, okay, how then, what will this do to the structure of an organization? Again, a logical question because we're used to these big pyramid structures, and uh, and and that's the way we've been told that it's necessary to do. Now, um, if you start thinking about this, uh, at least uh, what I've done is that that you uh, that you see that this this asks for something that's much more flexible, organic, round. You know that that can that can move and change. And the funny thing is. Uh, so, so we we define an, an organization in, in in basically in spheres of information and interaction. And the funny thing is that that is exactly what we see uh, in nature how how they do that. And um, um, so, if we we've set up a, a, a practical framework, that practical framework basically uh, says that the uh, fundamental guidelines of this is that the organization must be. Uh, based on purpose and roles. Uh, the structure is not fixed, it's very uh, flexible, and it's driven by inspiration, motivation, and attitude. And then uh, autonomy and self-responsibility and empathy, that, that's are the rudimentary basis for, for such an organization. The structure basically always follows a need, either internal or external, and it always delivers a value proposition for all stakeholders. So that's that's the underlying concept that we built for the structure. Then from that you get a certain format, and again, so this this is all you know this is a, a, a basic principles, a basic framework. Right? So we di- we define an organization in in flexible spheres that fulfill a role and a purpose. These roles are solely based on a need, and therefore they're not permanent, and they fall always follows the consensus of the environment. So basically whatever events come out of the out, out the environment that's what then uh, being adapted into the structure um if i i, I just continue eh, because without the pictures it's a little bit hard to imagine but we fulfill roles no not so much based on skill and experience we fulfill roles about on individual motivation because that is what drives purpose and these uh, roles can be shared between teams and units. And then uh, a lot of people say, okay, so this is anarchy. No, it is not. There is still leadership in it, but the authority of the leadership is then not in a person, but in roles. And um, yeah, the last thing that we then try to do in the basic structure is to plan for how to create this holo- holographic uh, principle, uh, which we've seen in the six principles of self-organization. We allow uh, individuals to connect and share info wherever. Uh, we, we share roles between departments and people. We mirror and we promote diversity. Uh, and if you listen to somebody like, for example, um, 
Mr. Ricardo Semler. He has not used swarm principles, but he has come to exactly the same conclusions to do this. Now, you may say this will require a lot of administration. Uh, true, uh, but there are already applications and systems that can do that for us. And that's the same technology that is creating the, you know, the exponential change that same technology will help us with creating these self-organizations, these self-organizing collectives. So I'll, I'll stop here because as you know, well, this is good. This is good. I mean, I, I'm, I'm listening intently. And if I, if I play this back to you, um, I, I would see, I, what I see is that um, many organizations are holding themselves back. You know, I hear leaders complaining that we don't innovate enough. Um, well, why yep. not? Because you are so rigidly structured. Um, and, uh, and so indeed um, you got to go and, and flip this. I mean, Conway's law fundamentally says you organize, you get the results you organize for, right? Yeah. And so you keep on doing the same thing. You don't step beyond what you're doing. You don't stretch yourself into new where to play, uh, you know, um, opportunities. Um, you don't do things differently. Um, and, and that is indeed holding people back. Um, even though you have fantastic new talent in your organization, you know, they come in with a lot of enthusiasm and you say, oh, you're going to be an exchange agent. And then they hit the first processes and systems and structures. True. Um, and, and there goes their their morale and there goes their motivation. So yeah. what I hear you say is that indeed you got to go and start from purpose. You got to go and define the, the roles um, to go and, and meet the specific purpose. And then you structure indeed as a verb, you structure situationally um, right. to go and support where you want to go. Yeah. Um, instead of letting structure dominate where you what you deliver, yeah, um, true, and true. and then indeed you have leadership that also also situational. It is not about that that uh, the, the person with the BMW anymore. Well, you can still probably buy a BMW, but but that's not that's not the point. It is you know everybody can be a leader at a certain point in time, and frankly develop their own leadership uh, capabilities and, and skills. And yes. and then the last point, the last point is um, is this whole um, this whole notion of. Uh, Holography, which means that you know you 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 almost democratize is that really a democratize uh, knowledge that allows you to engage your organization into into your efforts, right? And engagement numbers are so look continue to be so low. You know, I, I'm not sure what the latest Gallup number is, but the last one that I looked at um, is that only 16 percent of your organization is engaged in the success of your corporation, in the success of your business and your organization. Right. That's less than one out of six. How do you pull them in? Um, well, this is a much better framework um, than um, than uh, the conventional structures, which is frankly suffocating and uh, straitjacketing people into uh, into the old way of working. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And and the funny part is, which if you look at this, um, look at a corporation like Microsoft. You know, they spent huge budgets on innovation, and they they pull in all these people to innovate, and then it seems you know. The bigger the organization, the bigger the budget for innovation, the more people they throw at it, the bigger the talents, the less innovation is getting out there. Because for some reason, they have structured it to such a way that that there is no, this 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 natural creative process, you know, Google started out with with putting play gardens in their, in their offices, you know, nowadays that's also getting less, but in the in the in the beginning you see this 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 sharing of ideas and the the funny thing is that if you look at at, at so, something simple as as a, as a bunch of fish you know there is they they constantly learn everything from every angle from every you know they they interact they communicate and they come up with the most brilliant things and and you may not see that because it's a fish but you know, when I look at them and how they how they respond to, for example, if I go diving, how, how I see I can respond fish that have never seen a diver or fish that have seen a diver, they have literally the collective have learned to behave differently. And and this this you know simple principle that ten thousand people know more than one uh, is what they utilize on on in every second if, of their existence. So uh, innovation uh, cannot be uh, a scientist or a creative person sitting in an office or in a laboratory. Okay, Eureka, I have found it. It More often, it's just a bunch of people getting together and shouting ide ideas to each other. Well, I can hear still, I can still hear a few of you in the audience thinking, yeah, but how do I do it in business still? And and I would say, I would play this back and say, you know, think about sports teams again. 
Yeah. You know, what do they do? How are they applying these principles? Yeah. Um, and you can apply a lot, a lot within your organization. Yeah. Um, I, uh, it's interesting you mentioned Google because, of course, uh, I think it was a project called Aristotle, yeah. where yeah. the yeah, biggest, the biggest it, yeah. research ever on uh, on what makes teams uh, tick. Right? It's not the best yeah. people at all. Um, uh, joining, having, pulling the best people into a team is not is not recipe for success. Uh, or, you know, for results that the team is producing. Mm. Actually, yeah. it's probably inversely correlated. Um, things like you know the collaboration, the 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 the, the rotating leadership. Uh, the psychological safety, obviously, that comes into those teams, they are defining the success uh, and the output of uh, of your organization as and, they come together in teams. And, and basically, playfulness. Huh? If you if you look at young children under seven years, they have no objections, they have no convictions, they they just start, and it doesn't matter. You can go to a war country, and they still find something to have fun with. Yes, and and well and so you and, and you know, there's this famous story of a bunch of scientists that tried to figure out the molecular structure of the H virus. And they spent 10 years and they couldn't figure it out. And then they made a game out of it and they, they pushed it into a company called Folded, a games collective of 250 people. And they, by making a game out of it, they solved the puzzle in 10 days. Now, so this is the, the, the one track mindset. And so this, this is the most important maybe subject of this whole thing it's it's the way we have been thought to uh think and behave now, and like you said right yeah this is getting us to the next one right and let me sure. get back to the other point you made on microsoft indeed for many years they invested tons of uh, millions of dollars billions and where was the output um and then such nadella came in and he um, he was inspired by uh, growth by uh, mindset uh, the book by carol dweck Yes, and he used that as yeah. a basis to turn his know-it-all organization. Where, if you, the culture of Microsoft was visualized, where people were spraying guns at you know at each other. I'm actually having a case um, <laughs> that I use in my class, um, <laughs> yeah. and, and that was there's actually a visual um, that the people depicted the or, the, the you know company uh, through, and they took it the this know-it-all culture where everybody was competing eternally to a learn-it-all culture. Yeah. Um, and it was all grounded in in mindset, in getting, taking a fixed mindset, bringing the f- people with a fixed mindset towards a growth mindset. Yes. And and so I know that is your third element. Um, you mentioned thinking, and so that is a nice a nice sag into uh, into your your the, the third element of your trinity of uh, success. Yeah, well, changing the mindset is is probably the the most important thing of this all. Uh, and and uh, if you would look at the model that I've developed and that. That took me at least uh, two years to come up with it. You see all those elements of, you know, interaction, connection, uh, self-reflection, uh, and for that you need uh, you need supportive uh, feedback and all kind of stuff. Well, you find that back, but the 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 the, the biggest thing about this is that we we have been this this is what we've been taught to think this way, and that started from a very early age, right? Um, it started with your parents, you know, somebody needs to be in charge, uh, there are rules which we must obey, and then uh, when you came at school it was the same, and the referee in the match, and you know, your boss at work, and the government, everywhere we go in society, there's always hierarchy, control, structure, etc. etc. We are basically programmed with the idea that hierarchy is inevitable, and which is totally not true, right? It's what we've been taught. Now, and on top of that, we we humans we, we have difficulty with change, with with uncertainty, right? Uh, we want a rational explanation for everything, and we believe that we're smarter than everything around us, even nature. And this this uh, basically inhibits us from 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 changing to this self organizing thinking. Uh, so we probably have to overcome several centuries of limiting belief systems. Now. Um, I think that that it works this way, and this is where the model is also based on, is that for people to change, they need a, they need a reason, right? They follow a, a certain uh, steps, and that is sometimes a little bit harshly uh, called the pain, the gain, and bridging the gap. Why, what, how? So why do we change? Now, there must be a really a reason. Uh, change must be necessary, and and I can tell that you can tell that to your child. You know, don't touch the candle; you burn your finger, and he'll keep on trying until he burns his finger and he never does it again. So we must 
first experience a problem, a frustration or a big opportunity, we need a motivation for this. And the second thing is the gain after that, we start looking for an alternative, something that gives us hope, you know, and also that we need to experience something that touches us, a feeling, a dream, a higher purpose. I always say, Martin Luther King doesn't say, uh, I have a plan. He said, I have a dream, right? And that inspired people. And the the second, uh, the last thing is then that we need a, 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 a rational explanation, a realistic part to reach these goals. It's something we can test and so on that basically reduces our uh, um, uncertainties and, and gives, a, gives a reason, something that supports our position and attitudes. And those three things together then actually give us the opportunity to really change something. Now, what we developed is then what, we, what I call the self storm solution, which is a model uh, and also a tool that helps people uh, understand what self-organization is all about and so that they can use it. And this tool combines human organization behavior and natural organization behavior. So, and that's important because I often get that objection, we're not human, we're, we're not animals, and that's true. So that's why this model basically takes the best of both worlds. There's a lot that I can tell about this, but well, <laughs> probably I don't the have one, the time for that. But this is the essence know, of the of the. Yeah. We know you can talk for twenty hours about the book and the concepts because you've <laughs> sure. been living this so deeply, um, and that's that's great. We're trying to go and give a teaser here in this podcast, uh, and please, folks, sure. uh, go and uh, look for Ava's book. It's called Swarm Organizations, so it's easy to find uh, on Amazon. Is it, Ava? Yeah, it's on Amazon and uh, and. Uh, also in the Netherlands on management book and ball.com. And, but you can also go to my, uh, my website, which is www.swarm-organization.com and you can download the PDF there. Before we summarize, and I sorry, I got already into the book plug, but anyway, sure. I wanted to, <laughs> to do that, um, is, uh, this notion of we're conditioned, uh, on, on hierarchy, um, the, the word conditioning is so important. I find, I mean, when it comes to, you know, mindset, we have to break through that conditioning. Um, and so what is encouraging is the younger generation seems to be already there, right? Um, they don't take that, uh, that old, uh, dominant leadership style very, uh, warmly anymore these days. Are you seeing that as well? <laughs> no, I'm, see I'm seeing exactly that. Uh, see, I, I've done this myself before I was any smarter than now. Uh, I, what we did, we took the most talented people and we put them in a, in an office somewhere and we gave them all kinds of restrictions and limitations, right? These were bright people from universities, you know, and, and, and then we wondered why they left after six months. These people want to work with purpose. They want to grow in their skills and they want some level of autonomy. And we didn't have time and, and attention to that. And they left. And I see today, I spoke with several CEOs about this problem. Even the big companies like Shell and the big banks, and they say, we can't get people into our organizations. They don't want to work here anymore. They are totally fed up with the hierarchical structural system. They want to express themselves and there's no room for it. Yeah. So separate, and this, this is something what I sometimes get, you know, this is, they tell me, okay, swarm organization is something that was nice to have. And I'm telling you, we'll, we'll need to have this in five years from now. Okay, um, good way to um, to complete your three elements. You want to take two minutes to summarize the the, the, the three core concepts as an as an integrated whole again, W H O L E. <laughs> okay, well, um, basically our contribution to uh, to the world at this moment uh, is that we created a new narrative for future proof organizations. And that's based on the six principles of natural swarm organization or self-organization, as you like. Uh, we, we propose the structure and the process uh, for a transformation. Um, we are, uh, I mean, we're not idiots. This will take some time. If you want to do this in your organization, it requires people to generally go there because it's so new. And uh, the third thing is that we developed basically a model that aids people and organizations to create that mind shift from hierarchical structures to self-organizing collectives. Thank you, Evert. Um, and indeed, you're saying it's uh, it's not it's not happening overnight. Um, I would push this a bit harder and say, but it is happening in places. 
uh, corporations sure. are yeah. onto this yeah. notion. You mentioned a few at the start. Um, I know an example of the organization called Birdsorg. Um, you may know them in the Netherlands. Yep. Um, they're fundamentally already organized in this way. They were yes. in the Peter Drucker Forum uh, yeah. Paul. Uh, presenting about uh, three years yeah. ago already yeah. with this approach. So yep. it's happening in places. p and is working on it, I know. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, consider this very seriously um, for your future. Break through your conditioning. Break through your break through the structures that are holding you back. Um, become future proof. You call it. I, li- I like to call yeah. it future fit. Um, yeah. Um, but the, the opportunity is uh, is large, and the need, and so is the need, frankly. Um, so wow, um, we have uh, talked for almost uh, thirty seven minutes already. This is a longer podcast than usual, um, but that's uh, because this is a, a fascinating topic, and uh, and Avid has got a lot to share. Um, thank yeah. you, Avert, for for being with us um, and uh, developing this uh, this this summary, this um, uh, overview of uh, of your very very important concept of swarm organizations. Well, thank you very much for that, Sean. And uh, please, you know, don't hesitate. Invite me back if you want to elaborate more on this. I'll gladly uh, uh, come out and uh, and talk about this uh, to anyone who wants to hear it. If there's one thing that I want to bring to this world, and it's the the notion that people are in front, there's a, there's a different way. It can be done differently and more humane and more uh, involved and intuitive. I like humane. Um, that's what I'm all about. Um, and I'll call you Mr. Swarm from now on. Um, and I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure we're going to go and do some more work together, uh, Avert, within our... I hope so. Um, Sincerely hope so, John. Within yeah. our organization here at the conference board. Um, one one little plug, um, within the conference board, we um, we are a think tank, we call it, we call ourselves, but I would yeah. like to, I, I like to think of it as a think tank plus. Yes, we do research. Yes, we do webcast podcasts as we're doing today, but we're also bringing uh, executives together into peer-to-peer networks, um, councils, we call them. Yeah. Um, and so uh, if you're interested in this topic, join come join one of our councils. Um, sure. There's always seats available. Um, we have 150 around the world, um, all the way from human capital to uh, governance, sustainability, um, and um, and I'm uh, operating within the economy, strategy, and finance and innovation space. So um, so please consider um, us for that purpose. Um, don't hold back. We'll do. And um, and what I um, what I want to finish off is is uh, just to uh, say thank you for listening to and investing your time. I hope you found this valuable. Um, if you did enjoy this episode, um, please uh, do subscribe to our off-the-shelf uh, um, channel or any other channel um, where um, where we have these these regular conversations with uh, with uh, knowledge holders uh, and particularly writers. Um, and um, and or check our full program at uh, at tcb.org/podcasts, um, and we're available on multiple, if not all, uh, podcast uh, delivery channels. Um, thank you all again, and thanks, Avert, for being with us. Um, and I look forward to continue our journey of, uh, of swarming together. Absolutely. Thank you very thank much, you. Jan, and all Bye. the listeners. Bye. This has been Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board.